First of all, Prime Minister Netanyahu, thanks so much for joining me. That's my pleasure. Um, can we start at the very beginning? Um, on October the 7th, Israel suffered what you've described as perhaps the worst day in its history. Um, attacks by thousands of terrorists from the south. One of the things that struck me, uh, speaking to families and others here, is the number of them who said things like, said to their children, don't worry, the IDF will be here in minutes. What went wrong that day? Quite a few things, and we'll examine it when the war's over, but uh, uh, I described it actually as the worst violence, the worst savagery perpetrated against uh, Jewish people since the Holocaust. Mm. Uh, the difference between what these savages did to us uh, and what the Nazis did to us is not very big. They basically wanted to annihilate every Jew. That's the Hamas charter calls for the murder of every Jew on earth mm. uh, and certainly of the Jewish state. Uh, the difference was not in intent. The difference was in capability. Mm. Uh, in the um, death camps uh, of the Nazis, uh, they murdered thousands of Jews each day and we could do nothing. Mm. Here they murdered 1,200 innocent people and the next day, even though we had these failings on that day, which will be examined, we rolled them back. Mm. And now we're going after these Hamas monsters in Gaza. Mm. That's the difference that Israel has made. But, but we now have the capacity to defend ourselves and even if we have failings, mm. which we did, we can defend ourselves uh, by fighting back something that the Jewish people couldn't do in the Holocaust. I know there will be an inquiry to come, but do you have a sense already of, you know, there's so many people in this country saying that the tech failed, uh, that the IDF didn't get there in time, all sorts of things just seem to have gone wrong. Yes, uh, quite a few. And, uh, yes, I have an idea, but I think it's premature to talk about it. Operationally, we've uh, reached quite a few conclusions and we're putting them into effect. But uh, remember, this war is ongoing. It's, uh, we're in its fourth month. It took the uh, U.S. and its allies nine months to vanquish uh, uh, ISIS, in, uh, uh, to, to vanquish the radical Islamic forces in, uh, in Mosul. Mosul is smaller than Gaza, didn't have this vast terror uh, underground infrastructure, had fewer fighters. Uh, so we're on, we're on course, but it's going to take some time. And in the meantime, yes, we have learned some lessons, which I, I don't think it's uh, right for me to impart them here. Um, now, you have a number of objectives in your war, stated objectives in your war against Hamas, but one of them is to defeat Hamas mm -hmm. and another is to negotiate to release the hostages. Aren't these things mutually incompatible? No, because if we... Uh, they both share one thing. You need military pressure. The only thing that gets Hamas to release the, the hostages is military pressure. Mm -hmm. That's why we've already released uh, roughly half of them. Uh, and uh, I think that's a major achievement, and we intend to release a lot of them. Uh, I think that uh, the only way that uh, you're going to achieve that and, and to achieve the uh, victory over Hamas is by applying military pressure, and that's what we're doing. I won't get into the question of how we're going to complete it because we're thinking about that too. Mm. But it's a fact that until we applied military pressure, we couldn't get anyone. Mm. We had uh, people held up uh, uh, in, in Hamas's hands for years and we couldn't get them out. But once we start applying military pressure, all of a sudden we can get them out. Now, um, the U.S. and other, others of your allies want you to wrap up the war in Gaza as soon as possible. But everyone you speak to here believes, rightly, I think, that it's going to be months of war to come. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile those two things, keeping your allies happy but doing what you feel you need to do in Gaza? We have to win in Gaza. We have to achieve total victory. Hamas cannot be left standing, coming out of the ruins with a V sign and saying, we'll do it again and again and again, which they promised to do. Mm -hmm. So first, for our own sake, for our own future, we have to defeat these monsters. Secondly, I don't think it's just our case. It's also the case, as I've told uh, uh, President Biden, I've told all the leaders who came here, I said, this is your war as well, mm -hmm. because this is not merely a minor skirmish. This is part of a major confrontation between the moderate axis of Israel and the moderate Arab states against Iran, the terror axis of Iran, who is the three H's, Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas, mm. and others. 
and the whole world is now watching. Who's going to win? They're sitting in the bleachers. Mm. Who will win? Will Iran win or will Israel win? Will they win or will the West win? So uh, I think that uh, what I say to our American friends, whose help I appreciate a, a great deal, I said, uh, the war will take as long as it takes, but it will result in total victory because this, our battle is your battle and our victory is your victory as well. Let me come on to some of the international aspects of that. Um, the day after in Gaza, for instance, there's talk about the fact that, of course, Gaza's schools need reform, the educational, mm -hmm. they have to stop teaching hate and much more. But uh, there are international organizations that were meant to be ensuring that for a decade and a half now, and clearly they didn't. Who on earth is meant to be in charge of Gaza after this is over? Well, one thing is clear. It shouldn't be UNRWA, because UNRWA, the uh, United Nations uh, special agency that was set up uh, for the Palestinians, in fact, perpetuates the uh, Palestinian refugee uh, status, because otherwise that's their bread and butter. And, but far worse than that, we discovered that there are 13 uh, UNRWA workers who actually participated, either directly mm. or indirectly, in the October 7th massacre. Uh, UNRWA is perforated with Hamas, and UNRWA is, uh, uh, in UNRWA schools, they've been teaching the doctrines of, uh, uh, of extermination for Israel, the doctrines of terrorism, lauding terrorists, glorifying terrorists. So the, obviously that has to change. We need in Gaza not only a full victory against Hamas and uh, demilitarization, sustained demilitarization, that can only be handled by Israel. If you have another international force that can fight the resurgence of terrorism, let me know. And the third is we need uh, a force there for uh, internal management that does not educate the children, the children of Gaza, to become terrorists, does not fund terrorists, and does not dispatch terrorists, mm -hmm. doesn't teach the annihilation of Israel. That's what we need. Uh, I can tell you how the first thing and the second thing will be done. We're working on the third. De-radicalization takes time and takes commitment. But what international allies do you have to help ensure that happens? Well, I hope that any fair-minded uh, government, uh, any government that can withstand for five minutes or even several months the uh, force of uh, anti-Israel propaganda will understand that their future is uh, intertwined with ours. Because if barbarism wins here, Europe will be next. America will be next. Iran will emerge victorious. Iran will, uh, uh, unchallenged, will uh, conquer the Middle East. Iran will develop unchallenged nuclear weapons. It will have uh, ballistic missiles to threaten Europe and the United States. This is part of a larger battle. And uh, everyone has a stake in Israel's winning. Can governments go beyond the immediate pressures that they're uh, that are leveled at them. The pressures of thousands of people on the street. Yes, thousands of people on the street. Let me tell you, in, I think in America, the great majority of people support Israel. They understand instinctively that Israel is fighting their battle. They understand instinctively what the terrorists, the radical is, Islamists say. They say, we're the small Satan, America is the great Satan. You, Euro Britain's you dependent. Europeans, are, I don't want you to be offended, but you're a middle-sized Satan. Okay? A middling Satan. A middling Satan, mm -hmm. okay? But for them, this is all one big, this is all one big battle of civilization, uh, our civilization against their, uh, their wanton aggression, their violence, their, their rejection of all the values that we hold dear, the ideas of liberty, of choice, of freedom, uh, uh, the rights of women, the rights of minorities, the rights of gays, all of that they want to sweep away. And the question is, do we stand or do we fall? We stand. We're committed to doing it. We have no choice. I think deep down in their hearts, all the leaders that I talk to, you know what they say to me? I'll say not all, okay? Nearly all, okay? That allows everyone to be the exception if they don't want to admit what they actually said to me. They say, we know you have to crush Hamas. We know that you have a just cause, but we're having pr problems with public opinion. So please help us out. Well, we're doing everything in our power to, uh, minimize civilian casualties against uh, an enemy, Hamas, that uh, is perpetrating a double war crime. They not only target our civilians, murder our civilians, rape women and behead them, uh, burn babies alive, they not only target civilians, they hide behind civilians, their own civilians. That's a double war crime. And we're fighting uh, this very difficult war 
not to give immunity to the terrorists because they hide among civilians, calling on the civilians to leave, sending them leaflets, calling them on their phones, telling them to leave. Many of them do leave, even though Hamas is trying to prevent them at gunpoint and with gunfire. And Israel should be uh, given the credit that it's fighting uh, both a moral war and a necessary war. Most of the leaders that I talk to, they get it. But well, it's a question of whether they can withstand the pressures. We can. I hope they can, too. Well, let me move on to another border and perhaps another war. Um, I was here in 2006 during the Hezbollah Second Lebanon War. That war eventually came to an end with the resolution 1701 at the United Nations, which meant that Hezbollah was meant to not stockpile munitions to fire at Israel uh, south of the Litani River. That hasn't been obeyed as far as I can see at all. I was up in the north again the other day, and you can see the Hezbollah bases. And I saw the footage of uh, UN vehicles uh, coming out of their base Hezbollah firing rockets into Israel, and the UN vehicles just did a U-turn and went back, and that's the peacekeepers. Is war in the north inevitable? It's up to Hezbollah, because we're not going to accept a situation where Hezbollah uh, attacked us on uh, uh, October 8th, a day after mm -hmm. the massacre, unprovoked. Uh, 100,000 of our uh, citizens along the northern border uh, left their homes, we cannot accept that they won't return. They have to return. When can they return? They'll return when uh, Hezbollah's aggression stops and when Hezbollah forces uh, uh, are removed from the immediate vicinity of our border. Uh, that has to be arranged. Now, we can achieve that either with diplomatic means or with military means. If necessary, We'll do it with military means. Diplomatic means have been tried, and they haven't yeah, well, worked, have they? No, they haven't worked because uh, uh, they haven't worked because I think Hezbollah uh, overestimated their capacity, their military capacity, and underestimated our military capacity, and more importantly, our resolve. We've been uh, exchanging blows, but our blows are very significant. Uh, you know, Douglas, three and a half months ago, before this war began, we were debating. This is known. Uh, whether to remove a tent, a Hezbollah tent, right next to the border fence between Israel and Lebanon. Well, you know, we've gone a considerable distance beyond that. Uh, you know, um, uh, you, you follow all the things that we do uh, in Lebanon uh, against Hezbollah forces, against Hamas forces, uh, hosted by, uh, Hezbollah's, uh, by Hezbollah in Beirut and elsewhere. We act. And we're absolutely determined to remove this threat from our northern border. Again, can be done, uh, but it could be done peacefully, or it can be done militarily. And we're determined to achieve that. Uh, let's say you have to do it militarily, which seems to some of us to be the most likely outcome, let's say. Um, what international support would you have for that, given the tense relationships the world seems to have with what you've already been doing in Gaza? Look, we have to do, uh, you, you know this statement, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. I do. Remember the days when you could actually say that. Well, today you say, a person has to do what a person has to yeah. do, okay? Well, I, let me uh, uh, extend that. A nation has to do what it has to do to survive. And if we have to take uh, action, both in the South and in the North, that is uh, 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 understood by many to be a just action but cannot be uh, but they cannot stand the uh, heat of public opinion, then we'll uh, just have to do it alone. And we'll do, we'll do what we need to do. Word is, you don't have to confirm whether it's true or not, but word is that Secretary Blinken referred to the, you didn't, that Israel didn't have credit for a much longer war in Gaza. How would America uh, believe that you had enough credit, if that reported phrase is right, to begin a war or continue a war in Lebanon? I think uh, American public opinion uh, and the, 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 the American polity in general, not uh, its uh, extremes, uh, especially on the uh, ultra-progressives, but most of the Americans across the political divide understand that Israel is fighting a just war, that Hezbollah and uh, the Houthis and Hamas are the bad guys, and Israel are the good guys. Uh, admittedly uh, uh, criticized inordinately with an, an 
I was going to say a double standard, but that's, you know, I'd settle for a double standard. One standard for the dictatorships, one standard for the democracies. There's a triple standard here, uh, a special standard uh, reserved for a democracy called Israel. It's everybody, of the leaders that I speak to, they all understand that. Uh, but again, we'll do what we need to do. Israel will do what it needs to do to protect itself. Uh, I think that there is a larger element here because Hezbollah too is part, is an integral part of the Iranian axis. Well, I want to come on to that in a second, but before we do, can we just touch on Qatar quickly? You had enormous success in recent years with the Abraham Accords of countries in the region signing uh, agreements, normalization agreements with Israel. Um, but there's a number of countries that stand out, and perhaps the most obvious is Qatar at the moment. Qatar hosts the leadership of Hamas, it funds Hamas, it also funds significant amounts of infrastructure, is invested in infrastructure in countries like Britain, in the United States, just been caught spying on uh, a number of US senators. Um, what should the West's attitude towards Qatar be? I think we should demand from Qatar that hosts Hamas leaders, they host Hamas leaders, they fund Hamas, they also operate Al Jazeera, which is a, a you know, just distorts the picture, not in English, but in Arabic, it's a, a major source of incitement in the region. To use the, their leverage, and they have considerable leverage over Hamas, to uh, uh, achieve the release of the remainder of our, hosp uh, our hostages uh, in the immediate uh, uh, time, to get the, uh, the medicine that uh, we put in there, that uh, they promised that would reach uh, our hostages. But if, if Qatar does actually have the power to influence Hamas, what excuse is there for the hostages not having been released? Does Qatar have the influence or not? And if it does have the influence, why isn't it using it? It has considerable influence and I expect them to use it. Are you confident they will? No, but I expect them to do it. And what are the repercussions if they don't? Well, I think that uh, the entire world is looking uh, at Qatar and uh, they want to see uh, if, they, uh, if they use all the means at their disposal. They have significant means. And again, I expect them to do it and I think other countries should as well. What would, for instance, the United States be able to do about Qatar or Great Britain or other countries with? That's something I'll speak to them directly about. You'll speak to the leaders of Britain and America about that? Mm -hmm. But I expect uh, Qatar to live up to its uh, promise, to uh, uh, use its influence and achieve the release of the, the hostages and the delivery of the medicines right away. It complains, of course, that it's an intermediary. Um, but do you think Qatar is an intermediary? Well, look, I, I don't think they're, uh, they're uh, uh, an intermediary that is uh, passive. I think they have enormous leverage on uh, Hamas. And again, I'll say it the nth mm -hmm. time, I expect them to use their leverage. Let's come on to the bigger uh, question then, uh, Iran. Uh, everywhere in the region, whether it's in Gaza, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in uh, Yemen with the Houthis, um, everything leads back to Iran. Mm -hmm. how, can you, how can you solve any of this without addressing the question of Iran? It seems to me you're, you're, you're at risk of fighting skirmishes in the Iranian war, but your prime enemy that says it wants to annihilate this country we're sitting in uh, is still sitting in Tehran. Yeah, well, I think that uh, a total victory uh, over Hamas will impact this larger, uh, this larger contest because people will see who's winning, Israel won or Iran won, the West won or Iran won. Uh, and I think that will have an influence on uh, other countries in the region and other conflicts in the region. But secondly, there's a larger uh, issue as well and that's Iran's quest to uh, develop nuclear weapons. Because if you, 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 you can see what Iran is doing now without nuclear weapons. It's, uh, uh, it's sending terrorists across uh, the Middle East and the world. It's trying to uh, subvert governments. It's uh, using its uh, Houthi proxies to block the international maritime uh, uh, route in uh, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, it's, uh, 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 its proxies are killing Americans as we speak. In Iraq and... Uh... Well, yes, in many places, not only there. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, and attacking them uh, continuously. So th this is what Iran is doing without nuclear weapons. Now imagine they had nuclear weapons. And we, we understand, we can see in the world, what does it mean 
when you have a country that is aggressive in intent and has nuclear weapons, you can see what is happening with a, a much smaller country, a much less uh, dangerous country, North Korea. Uh, it develops nuclear weapons and half of Asia quakes in fear, can threaten Japan, and maybe very soon the, uh, the United States itself. Well, Iran is different from North Korea because Iran has an ideology of, uh, uh, of uh, domination and conquest and subjugation. They call us the small Satan. They call the U.S. the great Satan. They chant death to Israel, death to America. Can the United States, can Europe, can the civilized world allow such a regime to have nuclear weapons? And the answer is no. So the jury is out on all of us. You've been, you've been calling for um, stronger international attention towards Iran for decades now. Mm -hmm. um, but yet Iran seems to have been getting closer to the bomb its influence in this region seems to have only widened. Um, whose failure is that? Well, I think that uh, we've delayed Iran's uh, uh, quest for the bomb, which, uh, uh, which was not uh, obvious, but probably by a decade. But we haven't stopped it. Uh, I think my government worked. Sometimes I worked alone uh, against the entire world. It said, we'll make a deal with them. Uh, you know, the, the, the so-called JCPOA, that will stop them. didn't stop them one bit. It gave them the means to develop uh, centrifuges that, are, uh, that can enrich uranium at far higher rates uh, and, uh, and gave them billions of dollars to boot uh, in order to uh, develop their terror infrastructure and their military uh, industries, which they're now using to help Russia. All of that was done against uh, my warnings, and I fought alone, sometimes completely alone, but we did manage uh, successive governments under my leadership uh, and was able to halt Iran's uh, uh, march to the bomb. And sometimes with American support, uh, I think that this is, uh, uh, this is a, a, a vital interest of uh, all of us because Iran is different from other countries that possess nuclear weapons, with the exception of North Korea. I'm not sure that it has the... Uh, the careful calculus of cost and benefit that anyone uh, holding nuclear weapons should have. It's not at all clear because they're a theological thuggery. They're very aggressive and they have a theology, uh, a radical Islamic theology, which uh, points them in direction not only of uh, the conquest of the Middle East, but of uh, global domination. Now, you may think, oh, that, that, that can't be true. It is true. It's exactly what animates them. And, you know, you wake up, uh, Churchill, I think, used to say that democracies sleep until the jarring gong of danger wakes them up. Well, uh, I, I think uh, too many countries and too many leaders have been asleep too long. We have to act to assure that Iran will not have nuclear weapons. And I certainly intend to do so. If it's up to me, they won't have it. They're close on fissile material. They still have other problems to develop such weapons. And it's... Uh, it's up to us, to all of us, and it's up to Israel, too, but let, to make sure that doesn't happen. Let's say you do actually manage to destroy Hamas in, uh, in uh, Gaza. Um, why would that deflect Iran from its major goal, as you describe it? I didn't say that it would deflect it from the, the or, major goal. I said that there are twin goals. One is to uh, defeat Hamas in uh, Gaza because it's trying to uh, use its proxies but why would and that... other means to conquer the Middle East. Stop that. But secondly, and in parallel to that, act against Iran's uh, attempt to develop nuclear weapons. You're quite right. They're two uh, separate, but, uh, separate issues, but they're joined in the hip. And the hip is Iran's aggression and ideology, which has to be blocked here and there. But just sort of finally on this point, I mean, if, since they've continued to push in the region, they continue to push at all of your borders, they continue to search for a nuclear weapon, surely, I mean, all of this is going to be the case unless there was a regime change in Tehran. Uh, you're probably right. Does anyone agree with you? Well, I agree with me. That's enough. A few more. Okay. Um, as we start to draw to a close, let me bring us back to domestic issues in Israel. Um, it seems to me that the uh, Israeli public had suffered such a shock uh, and are still going through a trauma about what happened on the 7th because they never believed that this was possible. They never believed, they might, they believed that there were rockets that would come in, they knew that they'd had that for years, but they never thought it was possible that Hamas would break through and come right into Israel. 
Some people I speak to say uh, in Israeli politics and security establishment that you had the conception wrong. That the conception was that Hamas wanted to be corrupt and get rich, and that the government, security services, and others didn't believe that they actually wanted to do what they did on the 7th. Well, it's actually, uh, it may be true of some people, but it certainly wasn't true of me. Uh, because I believe that we can't cut deals with Hamas. I called them uh, ISIS many years ago. I, I, when uh, they took over, I said, this is Hamastan. These people will, uh, will work to uh, uh, attack us. I warned that they would rocket us. Uh, this was dismissed at the time that we left uh, Gaza. I left the government before that happened. I resigned from the government. I said, this is what will happen. We'll have a terrorist state of these... Uh, uh, this Muslim Brotherhood branch that will seek to destroy Israel. So the question was, what do you do about it? And my conclusion was that we have to continuously uh, cut, cut these wild weeds. But we didn't get the uh, agreement to actually yank out the weeds because, as I once said uh, uh, in a government meeting, I said this would require sacrificing hundreds of our soldiers and... Uh, probably will end up uh, having quite a few uh, casualties uh, on the Palestinian population, given uh, Hamas's uh, uh, tactic of uh, hiding behind civilians mm. while attacking our civilians. Uh, and it will create other problems. We couldn't get the domestic consensus to uh, make such a, 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 a definitive uh, a solution to the problem of Hamas. That is, no one would agree across the Israeli uh, public to go in and basically destroy Hamas, uh, go throughout Gaza and destroy Hamas. Uh, we didn't have uh, the international consensus either. Nobody would understand. Mm. Why are we doing it? Both conditions were created because of the Hamas uh, savage attack on Israel on uh, uh, October 7th. But look how difficult it is for us to sustain this effort, which we are and which we're committed to, to achieve total victory, that after the worst, these horrific, horrific acts of uh, barbarism, uh, we, still, we now, three, four months into the, the battle, we, we have this uh, crit critique of Israel. So my view was, you know, we basically degrade their military capacities again and again and again. But I think that has changed now. Uh, with the broad consensus of the Israeli public mm. that we have to go in there and achieve total victory. There is no substitute for total victory. Two final questions, if I may. Um, firstly, uh, on your own... Um, on this, this happened, well, let me put it this way, this happened on your watch as mm. Prime Minister, uh, October the 7th. Um, a number of people, senior in the military and intelligence apparatus in this country, have taken some responsibility for it. Do you? Well, I think there's a, a responsibility and a, a mission of a government to uh, protect its people. And clearly, uh, we failed in that. And all of us will have to answer questions. When at the end of the war, there will be investigations, there will be uh, uh, systemic uh, uh, examination of what went wrong, and uh, responsibilities will be assigned. That's fine. I'm not concentrating on that now. I'm concentrating on one responsibility that I have, and that is to win this war and achieve total victory. And I think that'll, uh, uh, that's what we should all concentrate on. Now, you're the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history. Um, and you've seen political leaders come and go, a bewildering number among your allies. How many presidents is it now? Uh, Who's the, counting? Of the United States. I'm not counting. Um, You've been in this a long time. They, um, there's a famous statement that was made of Joseph Chamberlain, not of Neville Chamberlain, but of Joseph Chamberlain, that all political careers end in failure. Mm. Do you think that's the case with you? I don't care. You don't care? No, I don't care. This uh, whole, uh, um, you know, the whole uh, legacy uh, obsession is, is one that I've, um, I, I don't really... Uh, care very much for. I'll tell you why. Because, first of all, it depends who writes the history. And history now is being rewritten in Wikipedia and all that. You know, people just distort history. You can't really control that. What you can do in the time allotted to you on this earth 
is to do your best to, uh, uh, to uh, serve the purpose that you uh, dedicate your life for. I've dedicated my life to, the, uh, to ensuring that in the coming decades, Israel will be as strong and as powerful and as prosperous to ensure the questionable permanence of anything, but the questionable, the permanence of the Jewish state. Uh, I say that with a philosophical observation that what is permanent? Hmm. Uh, uh, but that's what I've, uh, uh, I'm allocating and dedicating my efforts uh, to. So I don't really care about that question. You can't control it. Uh, Unless, uh, as Churchill said, you write it yourself. Well, you, you could write it yourself. You've already I did. Started. I wrote, I wrote already autobiography. It. Uh, yes, I did. But uh, that's just to, to have my record uh, there. But, you know, the forces that distort uh, public opinion mm. are so vast, not only in Israel, uh, that seek to distort it. And the thing that I draw encouragement from, because I go around the country and I talk to our soldiers, I talk to the uh, reserve officers, I talk to uh, uh, members of the public, and they basically get it. They get it, you know, that I'm leading the charge for a total victory, that I'm, um, uh, I'm representing them in many ways, uh, and they, they appreciate it. And I, I see that. You know, you know I, I met a, a very uh, famous uh, entertainer in Israel, uh, and he, he belongs to the left. And we met on one of these many events that he was uh, appearing in, and I came there. Uh, as well. And he said, Prime Minister, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, sure. He said, you know, I don't belong to your camp, but I want to tell you something. I go around the country, and what I see about the war and about you is diametrically opposed to everything that I hear in these various, uh, uh, in the mainstream uh, television studios, which are all uh, very hostile, okay? That's not what I hear. It's not the polls that they publish. I'm telling you, it's fundamentally different. And you know something? I go around, and when I talk to the people, and I talk to our soldiers, I'm telling you, he's right. Legacy put aside, victory put forward, achieve it. So there's another chapter in the uh, biography of Benjamin Netanyahu. It's not my biography that counts. It's not my biography. It doesn't help. The sands of time, you know, will wash away, the, the waves will wash away everything, all the footprints in the sand. That's what happens. But, you know, we have to do what we can in the time that we have available to uh, defend this country and to assure its future. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I care about. Prime Minister Netanyahu, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.